seem to be able to claim on benefits uh, for anything. You know, they, they sort of uh, looking after their mother, who's not particularly ill. You know, but they to be able to make a claim is so easy today. You know, I hate this sort of handout community. I, it really bothers me. I mean, all my kids have worked since they were able to. My family have done quite well in life and they have been able to care for themselves and they're lucky. But those that can't, yes, there's always a need to help those, I think. You know, we're not all born quite so lucky, are we? You know, so yes, there should be help for those. But on the other hand, I think some need an egg on to start the day a bit, really, and get out and try. I've been unemployed and it was fairly horrendous having to be on a uh, job seekers allowance. And that was. I felt that that was perhaps not uh, best fitted to getting people back into work sometimes because you were being pushed towards jobs that you might do for a couple of months and then you'd pull out again because presumably they, they need to hit quotas, they need to get people back into work and if you end up working as a cleaner or you're working on the shop floor and it's not something you're necessarily going to do for a long time, it seems slightly pointless to get someone back in and then they come back out and it's a vicious cycle. And it's just awful, awful that anybody should be in that state of poverty um, through no fault of their own. Um, through circumstance or illness or, or not ability to have education or anything, I think benefits are really crucial. I, I can't see why we'd want to take that away, but maybe, you know, not, not, not too generous. It's a little bit hypocritical because in the beginning when they did the benefit system, they did say, OK, if you want to be on benefits, you can't work, you have to stay like this to get a certain amount of money. And now all of a sudden when the economy is crashing, people that haven't worked for like 16 years with illnesses are now being tested to go back to work. I haven't been in the market for a good year because of where I'm situated in Ealing. Even though I come in and do the school run with Aidan in the morning, the dynamics of my day, I can't really hang around or walk around and say hello to people. Only this morning I've seen that people have moved on and faces have changed, so things have changed drastically in a year. I was born nearby in Paddington, St Mary's Hospital, so just down the road. We were made homeless um, after my husband declared land to the Housing Benefit Department. They said because we were no longer entitled to our top up of housing benefit, we had made ourselves intentionally homeless. In the first week in January, Housing Benefit called me. I was doing the school run and um, she said, your housing benefit won't continue and you owe a back pay of £76,000. So that wasn't great news when you're starting the day off doing the school run. So yeah, that's how it started. Um, I was bamboozled really, £76,000 is woe money to me. So I was in shock. My father-in-law passed away in Ireland and he left some land in Galway, rural Galway and um, that's the land we declared. When we went back to the council, because there was a big debacle when we did declare it, and that was all verified, but they said if you have a, a capital asset of more than £16,000, you're not entitled to any housing benefit or council tax benefit. They told us if we went to sell the land um, to keep a means-tested benefit, uh, we would be done for diversing ourselves of capital to keep a means-tested benefit, and that is fraud. Whereas we only found out late last year that if we marketed the land, our housing benefit would have continued for a discretionary six months. It would be reviewed and it would continue again. So the wrong advice was given to us. Most definitely if we lied, we wouldn't be in this situation. I've had high officials tell me that and other people, you know, you're a fool, why did you declare it's in a different country? They would have been none the wiser, which is true, but we were just trying to go about our day-to-day -day life and be honest. Vinny's in a special needs school in Ealing, so I have to, once I've dropped Aidan to school in Kilburn, I realistically have to give myself enough time to get back to Ealing. Because of my physical impairments, I sometimes am stopping and starting, especially if it's a bad weather day, I might be stopping and starting quite a lot. So dynamics wise, it's just not a good idea for me to stay in Kilburn a long time and then head back to Ealing and wait for Vinny's bus. The move out of Kilburn has been detrimental, not only to myself, but to all of the children. Vinny is autistic and I know a lot of people do home in on him and say, you know, you have an autistic child, it must be hard. But it's actually hard for all of the children have suffered 
because we were told the emergency accommodation would be six weeks to three months. So we said we wouldn't move schools, we'd keep them in as much of a routine as possible. Now over a year later, still in the same place, the travelling from borough to borough has had severe effects on two of my son's health and um, it's just not been nice. They lose contact with their friends, they stop going to after school clubs, they can't do after school clubs in Elam because the time they get back to do local activities they're exhausted and even Anthony having to travel now that distance to work he's always tired. You miss kind of in the summer, e summer evenings we've had a few days now of beautiful weather you'd get out and you'd go for a walk in the park we're too tired and it's you know I'll admit that to you stuff like that has stopped because you're you're exhausted from the traveling. Um, I have brought my children down here but not in the last um, year um, when we were living in our previous accommodation which is a 10 minute walk if I took the children after school I'd bring them in here for a wander around my son bought his first pet in the pet stall here so the children know the market very well they buy their birthday balloons here for each other from the cards shop We've just had figures that show that Brent is the worst affected borough with the overall benefit caps. We've got over 3,000 people who are going to be affected badly when the um, caps come in. Uh, we've got 3,000 people in temporary accommodation and we've had that number of people for years. We've got 19,000 people on the waiting list. We've got, at the moment, 8,900 council units, though we've got, there are about 14,000 housing association units but you add the two together demand does not meet supply does not mean to demand um, we've got high demand for three and four bedroom units and of course those are the units over the years we don't build a lot of you know um, if you apply for one or two bed you'll have a five or six year wait if you want a three or four bedroom unit you're going to be waiting until your children leave home, basically. The council placed us in the private Sarah, accommodation. Sarah. Obviously, we went into a four bedroom house. There was no caps on benefits, so they could say, well, no, look, you need to be in a four bed. We'll place you in a four bed. Don't worry about money. Housing benefit will take care of it. There's no problems. But now we've been put into a temporary three bedroom house. It is cramped conditions. My older daughters, who are 16 and 12, they share the living room as their bedroom space. My husband sleeps in the single room that isn't glazed, the window isn't glazed at all because our son who was in there originally was getting asthma problems and um, the house is in a bad state of repair. It was left for over six months. The garden had old furniture in it, bags of old clothes with matter in it, shards of glass. Finny I've spoken about before, he is autistic and four. He has no awareness of danger and he went to climb out the bathroom window. It took them six months to put a lock on a bathroom window. Now, someone said to me a while ago, why didn't you put the lock on yourself? I said, they, they tell you very clearly not to tamper with the property you're in. And if they're paid, they're paid good money to maintain that property, they should come and put the lock on the window. Hi, sweetie, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, financially, my, hus my husband's a full-time bus driver at Crookwood, Crookwood Bus Garage. Um, we receive child benefit and tax credits. Um, I was actually recently awarded disability living allowance, which has been a great boost for the fact is, in the morning, I'm so stiff, I've been getting a taxi to the station with the children, and that's eight pounds a pop. So I was, I was just absolutely overwhelmed when they gave me that decision, you know, so... That's how we financially survive. That's £3. Lovely. And that's five, yeah? Lovely. Thank Have a lovely you. journey, Take right? Care. Thank okay. you. All the best, yeah? See you soon. Thank Bye. you, thank you. We were given another eviction notice two weeks ago on Friday, and that's for the 27th of May. It was a hand-delivered notice in the morning at 9 o'clock, and it just said we have to evict by the 27th of May. And um, I think that includes bailiffs and that type of scenario come in to evict you. Um, my solicitor has in the last few days written to the council saying that they will have to get a court order to remove us. We want secure accommodation, we just want to be able to mend our family and have a home again. And you know, no, no one has admitted to giving us bad advice and they can't even prove they gave us the right advice because there's no paperwork. We just want a secure home to mend our family and get on with life, you know, because 
fair enough I'm biased but I think I've got some quite good children I'm raising in this society and they're doing well. The problem isn't just Brent's, it's London's, it's Great Britain's, there's a shortage of housing everywhere so we need to build more housing. Because of the shortage of um, private housing the demand is so high that it becomes um, out of reach of many of the people who need the housing. Central London, Kensington and Westminster, most ordinary people can't afford to live there anymore but they need to work there. So London needs to be a working city so we need to have sensible rents for ordinary people to be able to live there. The housing benefit change first kicked in several years ago when they introduced the cap on the local housing allowance uh, for housing and that had a big impact in Brent because we've had landlords giving eviction notices because they were capped at sort of either three, four, 340 pounds for a three bedroom or 400 pounds for a four bedroom and because of the demand they can get double that from people who've got cash to pay um, so they just saw oh the wonga in their eyes and they've given people eviction notices so they've had to come to the council for housing and we've been quite honest with them um, that if we do accept them as homeless and we house them we probably won't be housing them in Brent because we can't get the private landlords to give us the temporary accommodation in, anymore. So if they've been lucky, it's been over in the east of London. Sometimes it's Luton or Slough, but we've now had to have a policy where we're acquiring temporary accommodation in the Midlands because we cannot get private accommodation, which is temporary accommodation, in Brent anymore. Why have we got people in temporary accommodation for years and years and years? And why have it got to this position that people have been living off of benefits? The gov current government's got a diff different ideology. They want to blame the welfare scroungers, etc. Up until this happened, I never actually thought about people on benefits. I just thought people are on benefits for a reason. I've, never, I've just never thought about people that way. If you're in need, you're in need. But in the last few weeks, we've actually come across quite a bit of hatred. We've been getting some racial discrimination online. My daughter, Sarah, had to contact Facebook for um, cyberbullying. And we were told, you need to be begging more. You're not begging enough. You need to beg for what you want. And for my 16-year-old to come to me and show me this, I was, I was completely crushed because I would never think of someone on benefits as being a scrounger or a beggar. 85% of people claiming housing benefit are working because we don't have a living wage because people are on benefits for a reason, you know. I'm, I don't dispute, you might find the odd needle in the haystack that tries to work the system, but you cannot categorise everybody as being the same, but people do, they really do. Generally, um, if you're a council person, everyone's really homeless, actually, because you just don't own a home. So that's what it is for me. Um, I've met some serious homeless. I I've seen worse situations of homelessness to what I'm going through. I've kind of chosen this life somewhat. I'm temporarily back at my lovely mother's house. I was living at the top of this park, and I've now moved to the bottom of this park, but uh, basically, there's been some benefit changes. So, because um, my housing benefit entitlement changed, I've had to vacate the premises and find other accommodation. I think homelessness to me is how I'm living now. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit nomadic. It's just less of a home, it's just nomadic movements. Do you get what I'm saying? So you're not actually stationed and you're not stagnant in one place. You're kind of moving about and, you know, so that's what it is for me. It's less of a home, less of a roof. And it doesn't make you any less of a person in that sense of the word. So the juice bar was founded um, because I've got an illness called lymphedema. So I was being over medicated, um, different hospitals, and they just kept on um, getting it wrong. So the juice bar was my self-healing antidote, if you want to call it that. If you're looking at the rewards, it's been highly successful. We won, I think, 10... 11 awards and that, been on BBC and helped quite a few people in the community so in that sense it's been highly successful, yeah. Hasn't bought me that trip to Jamaica though, no. Kind of 
began us helping other homeless individuals and other vulnerable individuals because if you are vulnerable, the, the likelihood of you eating properly or being able to feed yourself on a really small budget um, is nil. So the juice bar was kind of like an alternative base for people like myself in that time. I've been offered quite a lot of finances to go corporate, but then I think that if I was to get my drinks in somewhere like Tesco's, they'd tamper with the product. And I'm trying to keep it 100%, at least recyclable, ethical, that whole kind of, you know. So we're a social enterprise. The reason why we're a social enterprise is because I just found it very hard just to make money, just just to be in it for the money. Even the other day, I, um, we helped a guy, who alcoholic. Uh, I don't know if I spoke about him before. Mr. O'Driscoll, he um, was in the IRA, got bombed, lost his memory and stuff. And everyone kind of was just always disrespecting him. So he used to come to the bar when we had it in Warsden. And I saw him the other day, Gave me a big hug and he's like, you know, you're the only person that kind of showed me love. A couple of people have done it since we've moved from Wilsden. And that gives me more than if I had like 500 quid in my back pocket, to be honest. I mean, you go home and you smile, innit? You go home and you say, yeah, I've helped somebody. So, you know, if I get 10 of those people, I think it's more of a better, it gives me a sense of drive. For me, um, I know exactly what I'm able to do running my own social enterprise. So I know how much I can push. And I think maybe I wouldn't be as motivated to work for somebody else. I've done it already and um, I was quite rebellious. So I think working for myself is the best option. So even if something was to happen to my benefit claim, I would have faith in it that I was supposed to stick to the social enterprise work that I do and work in the community. And I think um, I don't want to be tied down to nine to five. I, I don't want to be tied down to nine to five. I think. Um, I've become quite a dull person to be individual, you know, to be honest. Yeah, and I kind of love what I do. No, 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 no. So in five years' time, I probably won't be in England permanently. I think I'll be in warmer climates, <laughs> to be honest with you, being a bit more... Um, I need to be where fruits and vegetables kind of probably grow uh, naturally. Um, doing exactly what I do here, but around the world. Like, I wouldn't mind kind of helping, I don't know, some lovely orphans somewhere teaching them how to become self-reliant, self-sufficient. We're in my one-bedroom flat in Kilburn. I'm on incapacity benefit and income support. You get something like two pound a week extra on income support because the letter says your incapacity is not enough to live on. Why they don't give you enough to live on an incapacity benefit, I don't know. Well, me personally, they've um, said that someone like me has to pay the community charge, but I can't afford to... I don't have any extra money at the end of the week, so I haven't started paying it. I am resisting it, but I haven't got any money anyway, so... Am I resisting it or am I not paying it? I've got sciatica in my both legs and it's just so painful. I mean, I can't concentrate on dealing with customers for, what, 36 hours a week? I did try to get two hours a week work and that was hard enough. Who's going to want you when you say, oh, I'm, I can't come in today because my leg's hurting? I have looked at home working, but it's normally send us £20 and we'll send you the goods. Well, I've worked to pay tax to look after the sick. I didn't plan to go on the sick. If you can guarantee me that nothing will ever happen to you, then you're lucky. But it could happen to anybody. Yeah, I worked in Ealing for four years uh, as a call centre worker and then I was also a call centre worker, telesales. <laughs> But then I started getting a bad back, so I had to leave that one. I was there for a year, and the way they treated people was just unfair. So I joined a union and started getting involved with 
trying to improve the place. I just started taking things out of the newspaper about call centres and sticking it up on the notice board. Um, and it got people interested. And the main thing with me was I might ask them questions. I'd been trained as to get a degree. Um, they trained you. Your whole job was asking questions over the phone. So when you asked them questions, they didn't seem to like it. And they were just wanted to shut people up. And they weren't the hardest questions in the world. So we did manage to organise a walkout where, I mean, it was very small. It was just making sure that everybody had the same tea break at the same time. And the management went ballistic about it because it was like losing control. So we did the walkout and we went into the canteen. I had some rebel music and some sweets and made some noise and stuff. And then we locked the door and they were banging the door trying to get in. And I just kept saying, well, you didn't want to speak to us. Why do you want to speak to us now? And then we were planning to go back at quarter past ten, but because they were going mad, we just continued it. And they started threatening people, saying, you're going to lose a day's pay for this and trying to frighten people. But nobody did lose a day's pay out of it, so it did work. And it made... Not us so much, but the supervisors understood it a bit more and they did win some concessions out of them and they stopped the zero contracts for them. So we may not have won so much, but they did. I do have an interest in political action, yeah? I wouldn't even say it's political. It's, it just can be classed as political, but if your neighbour was being evicted, wouldn't you go and try and stop that eviction if you like them? Is that political? I'm on my way to the Kingsgate Community Centre where the Kilburn Unemployed Workers Group meets. The Kilburn Unemployed Workers Group is made of unemployed people who fight to ensure that they get the right benefits and also to protest against any government changes to benefits. It's made up of people who are at the deep end of things. It's the people who are actually claiming. There's no bosses between us. And so we're gleaning information from real cases ourselves. And then we can find out what protests we can do on behalf of any of the members. And we say never attend anywhere official alone. Because if you go there and then you say something was said, what proof have you got that something was said? If you send a letter without it being recorded delivery, how can you show that it was sent? The Kilburn Unemployed Workers Group you know, it has three roles. It kind of gives people basic advice, helps people with problems that arise at the job centre, and we also campaign politically about the broader issues as they're affecting everyone. I mean, I'm notionally like unemployed myself, so it's the kind of obvious group to belong to, but. There's a whole job of work to be done because like, at the moment the political rhetoric would have people believe that the main reason for all the problems that are facing people are because of the unemployed. You know, so the reason why there's um, like people are taking wage cuts, the reason why you know rents are going up, like practically every evil in society apparently is a result of like people scrounging and people who are unemployed, people who are disabled. You know, as though like bankers and the banking and the financial crisis didn't happen. You know, the government has successfully changed the kind of like political talk to put the kind of blame essentially on the unemployed. So it's kind of important that those people organise. People are like generally supportive, you know, people say you know, you're doing good work. I think the challenge is to get people to not be passive, you know, and just feel like things are happening to them and then seek advice as and when they need it, but to be a bit more consistent and proactive 
in being involved. So like, you know, we meet lots of people and help lots of people, little bits of advice, you know, on an ad hoc basis, we'll go in with people, go with them here or to read or these various other organisations and this network of organisations that deal with the unemployed. A lot of people claim to be aggressive when they're at the job centre. How do you know that they've been aggressive just because the job centre have said it? But if somebody goes with them, they might calm them down or be witness to prove that they weren't aggressive. Um, of course, you see, on the day to day, you see people get angry. And um, in terms of people coming in the office and, and being violent, it's only once you know, if something's happened of people's money being stopped. And obviously, they've got, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're supporting a family, they've got no money. They need, you know, to come in and vent their anger. I'm not against some regulations. All I want is fair treatment. If you have fair regulations that are dealt with fairly, rather than people saying that people didn't write the right thing on a form, were aggressive when they weren't, that's completely unfair. So I just want fair benefits. It's not sustainable, you're saying, it's just too much guidance and, and so forth to get through. If every time bring changes and there's new guidance, um, and it's not sustainable. I, mean, you know, I, I don't know. Even though I'm not you know, there anymore, and people phone up and ask me for advice, I don't know what to advise them because it's constantly changing. It's rapidly changing. You know, it's hard to keep track of it. It's hard to you know get your head around the guidance in, in, when, when I was there, let alone now. Um, so I think the job centre staff are probably feeling pretty demoralised at the moment, don't they? they're not sure what to do. The PCS union say that job seekers allowance should be £110 a week because of all the cuts that they've done. So it's not that we're making money, it's been stolen from us. It's not about discouraging you, it's if you can't find work you should have the amount of money that you need to live on properly. The Kilburn High Road is on the southern border of the borough of Brent. Um, it's probably one of the areas that has kind of maintained something of its kind of old identity in that people have kind of clung on here probably longer than in um, some other places. So there's still a strong sense of like working class history in the area. Um, like it's kind of also the place where people from all around the south of the borough come for their shopping. So you meet a lot of people out and like for kind of street activity. So this is one of the places that you choose to come. I mean, the Kilburn High Road is also like important in the sense of like the Kilburn Unemployed and what we're doing. Like one of the things is that it's got like 13 kind of loan shark companies just on the high road alone, which are kind of like basically trapping people, like, you know, putting them in this kind of form of like really perverse financial like bondage, you know, people who are vulnerable, that they know are vulnerable and the way they advertise and, you know, reel them in is like particularly pernicious and so we're working with the Kingsgate Community Centre where we meet to try and challenge these loan sharks locally. We're at, um, on the Wilson High Road on the back side of it. Over here you've got the Brent Community Law Centre which is where people go for their, the cases that need like legal advice. Next door you've got Brent Mencap which is a mental health advocacy and campaigning organisation in the area and then right next door to it is um, Wilson Labour and Trades Hall which is where the trade union campaigning and organisation goes on. We're just about to go to Wilson Labour and Trades Hall which is a campaigning base in the borough for the trade unions and the anti-cuts organisation, Friends of the Earth and other social activist groups. So we're upstairs at the Brent Trade Union Hall. Um, this is the main, the main hall. Downstairs is a meeting room where most of the meetings take place and then we've set up a library among the offices next door and that used to be on that side the Brent East Labour headquarters where Ken Livingston's campaign headquarters was. Um, this room itself would have been like hosted a hundred strong meeting of workers during the 1926 general strike and the building as a whole was a campaign headquarters for the famous Grunwick strike which kind of reshaped the kind of cultural and social racial politics of the area. The, I mean the benefit changes to my mind are like completely politically motivated, they're not to do with any budget deficit or anything economic in that sense. 
to my mind, and what we argue very strongly at the Kilwell and Unemployed Workers Group, that this is, and this is kind of like the relationship it has with the trade union movement. On the one hand, and this is what doesn't get talked about, is all the attacks on the conditions for those in work, zero hour contracts, um, you know, the government talking about, you know, scrapping the minimum wage or reducing the minimum wage, people, thousands of people working for free as interns or as work experience, you know, in trade union freedoms, all of these things are attacks on people who are in work. So the point about punishing and visibly punishing the unemployed is that those who are in work think, at least I've got a job, so they keep their head down. So while they're facing kind of cuts to their hours and all sorts of things, I think the reckoning that they make is at least I've got a job. So that's, to my mind, the reason why the unemployed are being so hammered. Not because the country can't sustain that number of people on benefits, it's more that they want to create an atmosphere among those who are employed in the labour market is of one of pre precarity and insecurity, so no one demands anything more. In terms of more people working, like, you know, it's a basic, you know, it's a long history. For 100 years, the unemployed have been demanding a shorter working week for those in work and share out the jobs available, you know. So that's one way of dealing with the employment issue. The, the pensions issue, people say it's unsustainable. The reason why the pensions have become unsustainable is because the last government did a big raid of like the public sector pension pot. Companies have not been forced to invest in, in pensions. And the general kind of insecurity about the future of pensions has meant that people haven't invested in them. But if you look at the figures, no, like pensions taken by themselves, if the government stopped raiding the pension pot, are perfectly sustainable. It's the economy, stupid. It's as simple as that. People are feeling very, very serious reductions in their standards of living. Everything you hear and see says that the economy of our country, um, of the whole of the European Union, America, the whole world is undergoing um, a serious shift as far as the economic certainties used to be. And that causes anxiety in people. If, in some instances, it will go as far as fear. And it is a fact that we, along with every other Western developed nation, is going to have to tackle what is an ever-increasing number of elderly people who do not work um, having to be maintained by a shrinking number of people who do work. Certainly the need to reduce the deficit is overwhelming. Um, I don't think anyone would argue with that. When you say, is there a political agenda behind it, I presume this coalition, um, certainly the Conservative part of it, and given the sort of half-hearted opposition that the Lib Dem part of the coalition has put up, to some of the policies. They do wish to see the rolling back of the state, but certainly with regard to the changes of reducing access to welfare benefits, this government has, in my opinion, employed very, very deftly um, black propaganda. And it does seem to me that the electorate has bought that black propaganda. My solution is that you smash this system. It's called capitalism, which is built on exploitation and built on class society. And the only my understanding of how you can do that is through the the empowerment and the organisation, the self confidence and the activity of like the the world's producers, the working class. Like you know, we produce all the wealth. We run the buses. We run do the posts, the transport, logistics, the factories, the mines. All of that is done by a group of people who depend day by day on the wage that these people give them. And while their profits, do you know, what I mean, the, the bigger that whole operation grows, the poorer we get in relation to it. The arguments for making sure that everybody is on a living wage are going to fall on stony ground because the prevailing image, and there are facts to support this prevailing image, is that the country ain't got any money. We're never going to go back to where we were before 2008. It's simply not going to happen. And how we create and structure a new economy, which is not just for this country, but for the developed world, is something that all political parties are fighting shy of actually confronting. The basic kind of like slogan from a hundred years ago, I think it was Rosa Luxemburg, 
she said it's either it'll be socialism or barbarism and you know in certain points of like capitalist crisis you have those two stark choices in front of you you know at the moment if you look at what's going on across europe there's a massive rise of the far right in italy and greece and portugal and spain you know unless there's a, a positive socialist working class alternative then what you're forced into is some form of barbarism fascism you know that's the kind of european form that it takes until you know that that is what will happen that the rich will seize upon those days of the working class who feel that there is no positive option and just foster a politics of hate and fear and if we get keep stuck inevitably as we always seem to do on money all the time we're never going to move forward there has to be more thought about what is more creative what is more imaginative how can we actually to coin another cliche push ourselves out of the prevailing envelope what is the kind of thinking whereby we can actually say this is what we want to be as a society this is what we want to stand for this is how we think we should be progressing how are we going to do it without automatically thinking the only answer is to go and borrow something the reason i would come to brent again even though i don't particularly want to live in london um especially is that to my mind in terms of the this it's a global economic system that we live under as he said brent you know being one of the most diverse boroughs in brent with this kind of like labor movement history in in the area isn't just important for what goes on in london or bren or the uk it's really a hub globally like to my mind who believes in a future that is like going to be for for by working class people this is like you know they have the un which meets wherever it wants to meet they have the g8 which meets behind secure barriers all around the world we have potentially a global conference of the working class in an area like brent or you know in london as a whole and that's an amazing an amazing potential so there's a lot to be you know fought for on the streets of london